Hi, I'm Dennis McCarthy, the guy behind the vehicles in the Fast and Furious franchise. I'm gonna talk about every major car from the franchise. 95 Eclipse. Yeah, that was Brian's car in the very first film. I think back at that time, you know, the paint was cool, everything about it. I think it really fit his character, and I think that's a car that, uh, you know, Paul Walker would have actually driven. 70 Dodge Charger. I mean, this is a car that I could go on for hours. Um, I mean, I think that car is really more of a character in the franchise than just a vehicle. It's a car with the supercharger, the bug catcher. Um, through the years, I've tried to always keep that theme consistent with everything that Dom drives. Part of the franchise and definitely part of Dom. So the 94 Super, that's a car too that I feel is very iconic to the franchise. I mean, you know, it seems like the cars that get a ridiculous amount of attention would be that Super and, and Dom's Charger. And really it all stems from that final sequence of those guys going head to head. I love the launch. I love seeing the tires on Dom's Charger wrinkle. And that Super pretty much had everything you could do to a Supra at that time. Mazda RX-7, the rotary motor was, I think, unique. Uh, the RPM capabilities, it's uh, kind of one of my favorite imports. I bring that back to the franchise later on. My favorite aspect of that was when uh, Dom lifts up the seat cushion and has the multiple miniature nitrous bottles. I thought that was just a great moment in the very, uh, the very first one. So Leddig's 97 Nissan 240. Yeah, that was a cool car. You see you're running that thing out at Race Wars. In the year that uh, the very first Fast and Furious came out, that car was huge. I mean, it was kind of like that transition from uh, muscle cars into the beginning of the import scene. 1994 Acura Integra, very easy car to modify. There was a lot of parts available. You could buy uh, you know, intake kits, exhaust kits, camshafts, uh, clutch kits. And that's a car that was really part of that big movement of import uh, racing back in, the, uh, back in the 90s. The Honda 2000, the first movie was so, uh, it was very heavy on the imports and that's really what it was about. The S2000 was another car. It was very nimble, very fast, worked great right off the assembly line from the factory, but just with some minor modifications, you had a real performer. 2003 Mitsubishi Eclipse, bright purple. It had these gigantic polished wheels, which I think Roman, or actually we'll say Tyrese, you know, was heavily involved in. I think they went through three or four different wheel choices. Though the car doesn't fit my personal taste, I know that car was exactly what Roman wanted to drive. And as far as the movie goes, I gotta say it was perfect. The 69 Yanko. When I saw Too Fast and Furious, I go, man, now that thing is absolutely awesome. And it's sitting here with us today. The car has been restored front to back, has well over 500 horsepower, has a Borg Warner Super T10, 12 bolt, all the key ingredients, historic muscle car. The GTR, I believe there's been a GTR in every single movie. It's one of those cars that was ahead of its time. The performance is incredible, the all wheel drive. Like I said, it's just uh, some of this part of the franchise from the beginning up until who knows. Another Honda S2000, it was modified beyond the normal. It actually had a supercharger on it, and that car can literally burn the tires through the first three and a half gears. I don't really like to be seen driving a pink car, but the, the horsepower made up for it. So the Mitsubishi uh, Lancer, Fast and Furious, a franchise really helped launch that vehicle into being how popular it became. Changing from all wheel drive to rear wheel drive, maybe 20% rear wheel drive. You know, we've, we've done a lot, a lot of work with those cars. Hopefully someday Mitsubishi comes back out with something similar because they kind of got away from that performance uh, feel that the original, you know, Lancers and Evos had, but uh, great car. S15, this was a car that was perfect. I mean, when we went to do Tokyo Drift, went out to Japan, basically every car show we went, every drift event we went to, it seemed like 40, 50% of the vehicles there were, you know, gonna be an S14 or an S15 Silvia. They're so easy to make drift or go fast or do whatever you wanna do. It's almost basically like the car was designed to become a drift car. And today, if you go to a drift event, they're everywhere. They put LS motors in these things. They put everything in them. So the Veil side uh, Mazda RX-7, it was everywhere, it was in every magazine, and we were able to make a deal with Veil side for their one and only hero car. The sad thing was, you know, of course, we had to change the color, so it's almost uh, painful when you get a car that has probably a $30,000, $40,000 paint job. The orange worked out great, it really popped on screen. We ended up building, I think, six other replicas of that car. I take that back, we built nine, we had to build a whole other set for Japan as well. But the one car that was our hero car that came directly from Vale side uh, had somewhere around 600 horsepower, a gigantic turbocharger. And I just remember one night down in Lower Grand where he literally had that car sideways, just blowing the back tires off of it for probably 300 feet. So a good one.
Once again, we bring back the Evo in Tokyo Drift, which like I said, was just a car we had to have. And that was the one that was completely uh, converted to complete rear wheel drive only. We didn't have to do that much to the motor. I mean, we did do some, uh, some computer work, some exhaust work, but uh, other than that, it worked great just as is. So the 67 Mustang, when I read the script for Tokyo Drift, uh, the Mustang opened up a great opportunity to do something different. We actually went with the R34 engine in Han, Sil in Han Silvia. The cool part about it was we actually built this car. It was 100% functional. We actually did a bunch of, uh, you know, drag race tests, you know, and it ran, I think, a 13.0 at 114 miles an hour. The 13.0 doesn't sound that, that impressive, but you have to realize we had uh, tires that were set up for drifting. They were very hard compound. So it burned rubber through the, uh, you know, through half the uh, quarter mile. Like I said, everything you see on screen is, r is real. The shots were the cars driving without a hood. And we got the camera was a shot that I, I begged for just because I said, look, man, no one's going to believe this car actually is a functioning vehicle unless you actually show it with the hood off. So, you know, we were pretty proud of ourselves because it was just such a unique vehicle. In Tokyo Drift, we, we actually had a, a VW van, and this car was for Twinkie. Twinkie was kind of a small guy, you know, looked fairly harmless, but when you pissed him off, it gets crazy. So that's really the, uh, the story behind the, uh, the VW van. The uh, Buick Grand National from Fast and the Furious. It's a, a car that was built in a time when American performance was really at one of the all-time low points. But the Grand National somehow broke through with its uh, turbocharged V6. It was a car that with very little modifications could dip into the uh, you know 12 second quarter mile times. And what we did is really just lower the car to the ground a little bit more, put some black NASCAR type wheels on it, and uh, goes down as one of my favorites. So fast forward, we get into a, uh, another Subaru for Brian. I read the script and I said, hey, they're down in Mexico. They're driving through dirt roads. I said, oh, hey, this, this has to be a rally car. Subaru came up and said, hey, we'd, we'd love to help you out. We basically put a roll cage, you know, changed up the paint, the wheels and the tires, eliminated all the computer things that prevent us from doing the stunts we need to do. And boom, we're, we're good to go. So all survived up until the end where we had to launch them out of a tunnel. I think we pretty much destroyed everyone we had, but uh, you know, the car performed flawlessly as they always do. So the R34, you know, once again, this car keeps coming back around and around and again, and it comes around and around for a reason because they're so they're so cool. I mean, the Skyline, the GTR, it's I think it's at the top of the list. Paul Walker himself actually owned one. He has an R34. 1970 Chevelle SS. That's one of my uh, personal favorites. I drive a 68 SS Chevelle myself. It worked for his daily street car. When the challenge came up to enter the race, he had to modify it, you know, once again, overnight. Turned into basically the gray primer version with the American racing wheels. Car featured a big block, manual four speed, pretty much cool on every level. The 71 Skyline, one of the worst positions you can put yourself in as a picture car coordinator is to have one vintage car that needs to run and drive every day. And that's exactly what we did. Because it was obviously a car that I couldn't duplicate unless I you know, flew one over from Japan. Did everything we could to prep the vehicle. And we were driving that car and you know, I think it was 100 degree heat. It, it you know, falls into that category of the, uh, the perfect car for that scene. The Gurkha military vehicle. This is a car that when uh, Hobbs is introduced into the franchise in five, you needed that. You needed something that just fit his character. And when I saw the Gurkha, I thought, you know, man, it's not gonna get any better. This vehicle's perfect. It's big, it's burly, it's mean. It drives through walls, it drives through houses. We actually uh, had one that was a legit, and then we had a couple that were uh, basically fake without all the armor plating and everything else, just to make them a little more nimble. So we had a couple of, you know, what I'll call lightweight stunt versions to go along with that. So the 2011 Charger, Dodge has always been a huge supporter of the franchise and they had just come out with a brand new model and we basically were working with a lot of prototype cars. If you'll notice, one car has the red and blues on, you know, and uh, that wasn't scripted. They somehow just got turned on by mistake. But, you know, in the afterwards, you know, looking at the footage, you know what, Roman would be the guy to turn the red and blues on. So we just left that as is. So we get into our uh, vault heist chargers. We basically assume that the team has taken the cop cars that they've heisted and, uh, you know, turn them into these vehicles to uh, drag that vault through uh, through the streets of Rio, which were actually the streets of Puerto Rico. And I tell you, for uh, those moments in the franchise when we destroyed a ridiculous amount of stuff, that's right there at the top. I think uh, Fate of the Furious might have it beat with the zombie car scene, but I tell you, we probably put, you know, 150 plus cars into the uh, scrapyard shooting that one one segment. 
here we open up and they're on this mountain road and this was an amazing scene. We filmed this out in Tanner Reef on this road that was uh, far more dangerous than it actually appeared and it appeared pretty dangerous. It was really just a great contrast I think of the uh, the GTR and the Challenger going head to head with Dom and, uh, Dom and Brian which is different than the normal you know Fast and Furious just straight line drag race. So the Dodge Daytona, this is a car that I really wanted to build. I brought it up a few times in the past. I didn't really get anywhere with it. But when we got to this film, there was one brief moment we were actually going to be out on the Autobahn. I said, you know what, if we're going to the Autobahn, we have to have a Dodge Daytona. It's a car that has the aerodynamics to keep up with, you know, European supercars. I said, it makes perfect sense. Well, the story deviated, the locations changed, but the car still stayed. It's not a replicate, replication of an original Charger. It's kind of my own version where we tuck the nose back in. Obviously, we slammed the car to the ground. We just streamlined everything. In six, we had a scene where it was kind of like a government issue version of a charge. So I had a lot of fun with that. We basically did kind of like a battleship gray paint scheme. You know, once again, lowered them, changed it up to a, you know, like a Mopar 20 inch wheel. There's really not a lot you can do to the exterior of that car because they're so cool as is. And when you do try to modify them, they just don't look right. And uh, it looked like a car that Hobbs would have had built in the military facility for the crew. So the Ford Escort Mark One. this is a car that's a huge favorite. When I went to the UK, I realized very quickly that this is like the Dodge Cuda of the United Kingdom. These cars are so popular there that uh, when we had our, uh, our team of mechanics that were the local guys, I couldn't get them to work on anything but that car. If we pulled up to set, we would have a Dodge Daytona, maybe a, an Enzo Ferrari, and we'd have the Escort. All the local you know, fans and you know, people walking the streets would instantly flock to the Escort. So I will say that the UK crew made those cars as authentic as they look on screen. I mean, everything down to the correct valve cover. The flip car, this was a really interesting car. I mean, there's cars that we build that are, uh, you know, a modification of something else, and there's cars we build from, from scratch, and that's the only one that came from scratch. Justin came to me and said, hey, man, I want to build a car that can run out of their vehicles and launch them into the air. I said, man, that's awesome. That's a great idea. And they were uh, fully functional. They had a 500-horse LS motor, Turbo 400, V-drive unit, so the motor side in the back, uh, power supply to a Dana 60 front axle out of a Chevy truck, and the rear steer was basically a system that we, uh, you know, robbed from the from the monster truck industry, where you had a toggle switch that could uh, self-center or maintain that angle as long as you want. I think it was the ideal thing for Shaw to be driving. It kind of showed Shaw's technical side and what he was really about. The Jensen Interceptor is a car that uh, Michelle Rodriguez still gives me a hard time about today. She really didn't like that car at all. She said, this car is ugly, I don't want to drive it. I said, look, this car is perfect, there's nothing better. You're in London, you've lost your memory. There was no other choice, I was totally just dead set. I said, this has to be in the movie, it's the right car. There's nothing that matches your character at this point in time and in this location than the Jensen Interceptor. So the Navistar military truck, the cool thing with, with that truck, it was a real one that was loaned to us from Navistar. It had every single, uh, you know, piece or modification that you would find out, you know, in the middle of a, you know, of a hostile military environment. It took a ridiculous amount of abuse. I mean, you would be amazed what we put that truck through and it never, you know, never, never flinched once. The Ford Mustang, this is a car that was originally built by uh, Pure Vision. You know, that car was probably somewhere between 700000 and a million dollar vehicle. We had to build several replicas, but uh, the hero car that you see featured in all the close-ups, the hero car you see with the hood off in the team's, uh, you know, headquarters was the, the true, you know, Anvil Mustang built by uh, Pure Vision. The car community recognizes them. They know the car. They know where it came from. They've seen it at the SEMA show. They've seen it in magazines. So it's great that there's cars like that out there from, you know, other builders that we can borrow to... Uh, you know, keep it exciting. So the uh, the 2012 GTR at the very end of Fast 6, this is that moment, you know, the end of the movie, there's not a lot of action. I want to go out and try to find the best part car I possibly can. And the only problem arose when we got to set and they said, okay, we want uh, we want Brian to pull into the driveway. It's like, ah, God, the driveway was just a gnarly approach angle. And we, we accomplished that. But then of course, you know, when I watched the movie, that part was cut out, but we did make it happen. The 67 Camaro, uh, we did a lot of modifications to make this car off-road worthy. You know, coilover, sway away, house steering rack, all the good stuff. The, the Subaru that we see Brian driving in the uh, plane sequence. Reese Millen uh, did the roll cage, the seats. Uh, rally car suspension. We did have to uh, give this car more boost basically because we were shooting the sequence up at Pike's Peak where we were, you know, obviously starving for air. We upped the boost as much as we could, you know, still utilizing the stock internals of the motor. You know, as always, the car was flawless, never misses a beat, starts up every time, compensated for the altitude and uh, got the job done. 
I think it would just disappoint every fan in the franchise if Brian wasn't in a GTR at some point of the movie. Brian's a little mature now, he's a little bit older, so we kind of eased up on the modification. We just did some very minimal little carbon fiber treatment, uh, changed up the seats, changed up the exhaust system. A good friend of mine, John, comes in and reprograms the system, so it basically diverts 90% of the power to the rear tires, 10% of the front, which is just strictly done so we can get those massive, uh, you know, overseer characteristic uh, drift scenes that we always have in the, in the franchise. The uh, 95 uh, Toyota Super is a car that was a, a really meaningful moment for me because this is after the passing of Paul Walker. The filming wasn't completed and the scene was, you know, the script was basically rewritten where we had this uh, kind of parting of ways between Dom and Brian. So it was critical that I found, you know, the best two possible cars I could. One of them being the Maximus Charger, which I saw in its raw finish, widened body. The car had over 2,000 horsepower. The only catch was it wasn't completed yet. The Supra was actually Paul Walker's personal car. And uh, I think it was, you know, the, the right ending for that film to have Dom and Brian in those two vehicles. The Challenger and 7 that Letty drives. This is a car that, you know, once again takes Letty back to her her Mopar roots. They were basically an SRT8 uh, six-speed manual trans. We added a locking differential, uh, better clutch just to handle the abuse of all the stunt work, uh, some aggressive bumpers, raised the stance to handle the drop out of the plane, and the wing on the back was basically an afterthought. It was a story point. I love the car. Michelle Rodriguez loved the car, and uh, it definitely looked great on screen. So the Lycan Hypersport, this car was a real tough one for me. You know, when I read the script, I'm thinking, my God, this is Dubai. These guys, you know, drive a Lamborghini Aventador, you know, to Starbucks in the morning. What, what am I going to feature? What can I put in this guy's, you know, penthouse? Somebody on the crew did, hey, check this out. I went, oh my God, I read about the car. I go, it doesn't get any better than this. It's the first UAE produced supercar. And they're only gonna build seven. It had the hefty price tag of, I think, $3.7 million. But it was really just the point that there was only seven produced and only seven guys were gonna have it. You know, once I met the guys at, uh, you know, from Lycan, we had a meeting, discussed the car, discussed what they could do for us. Uh, we really had no way to create these cars because we had no moles, we had no CAD data. So they actually built us the bodies, gave us some rollers on, a, you know, basically on a Porsche Boxster chassis. You know, everything was actual production quality. Uh, just under the skin, it was, you know, it wasn't a 200 mile an hour car, but luckily we we're only driving in the interior of a building. So I think 35 was as fast as we ever had to go. <laughs> Fleetline Chevy is one of my favorites. I just really love the fastback body style. You know, it just kind of set it apart. Dom's the underdog. He comes into this situation with, you know, half the horsepower of, of his competitor. And all he has to rely on is his, uh, his driving skill and his knowledge of cars. We have the nitrous gag. We have the valve. We show how Dom hooks it all up and it all makes sense. So the Ice Charger is another one of these, uh, none of these vehicles that basically gets partially designed by the task at hand. I thought, okay, great, we're on ice. You know, what can we do? What can, what's the right car? With Dom, you always kind of gravitate towards, you know, the 68 to 70 Charger as being kind of, kind of like home base form. So what can I do to that car to make it just plain mean? And then the other key factor is, of course, making it all-wheel drive. You know, you can stud tires, you can do whatever you can, but a two-wheel drive car is at a huge disadvantage on the ice. The A-arms are all custom fabricated, uh, basically setting the motor back almost uh, two feet to make room for a front differential. We had to widen the track to make room for the CV axles. Really the final product did exactly what we wanted to do. It was one of the few cars that we took out to my first test session and uh, out of all the cars I built for the franchise, it's probably my, you know, my new all-time favorite. So the Ripsaw is something that I'd seen in the past. Uh, I'd seen YouTube videos of this vehicle uh, in action. When you see the Ripsaw, it's really not that massive. I mean, it's really probably smaller than a Chevy Suburban. You know, it's like, yeah, we've, we've always got cool cars and cool trucks, but now we actually brought a tank into it. So, uh, like I said, it was, a, it was a fun one. So there you have it. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed going through a little history of the cars of the franchise. Make sure and check out uh, Fate of the Furious. You're going to love it.